this. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, so yes, this is um, a provocation from me, Josephine Hansom, a youth researcher. I don't necessarily work in, in the arts, but um, I definitely am quite an expert in, in youth audiences, helping uh, my clients understand what young people are about and what they're into. So for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk you through, firstly, uh, some of the resu results from the research that we uh, have recently published. Um, as Julia said, there are a few key highlights that are really quite interesting, and I'll share them with you. I'll then move on and talk about more uh, of the trends that I see at work. So a lot of my clients are into youth marketing, and we try and help them understand how to better connect with young people. And I've brought with me three trends that I see uh, in the work that I do as a youth researcher. And then I will end with my provocation. So my provocation will be built on some of the evidence I share in the research and also maybe some of the evidence that I've spoken about in the trends from my clients. So yes, obligatory slide. I work for YouthSight. Um, we're a specialist youth research agency. And we work with clients such as these, so Puma, Spotify, Red Bull, BBC. Um, we work with brands trying to help them get closer to young people to understand what's going on in their life and what is important to them. Quite often, the work we do is all about decision making. You know, the age from 16 to 25, we call that the decision making decade. And young people make loads and loads of decisions that change the rest of their life. And so a lot of the work we do is helping brands understand those decisions and really try and influence them. What makes us slightly different than maybe other organisations is that we've got the largest youth panel in the UK. So this means we've got 135,000 young people between 16 and 30 who've said they'd like to do research with us in the future. And we know a lot about them already. So we know obviously their age and their gender, but we know what they want to do when they grow up, how many brothers and sisters they've got, and what mobile phone they have. So we've got a really good relationship with this panel, and it's this panel that we use to do the research I'm going to talk through now. So back in May when I met with Julia, we were really sort of trying to understand uh, what we wanted to get out of this research. We wanted to look specifically at the student uh, uh, experience of music, uh, students' behaviours, um, but we wanted to really get some key, I guess, baseline figures to understand the volume of students doing certain things. We've called it a soundtrack to student life, and we spoke to 1,009 students uh, in this piece of research. So this is a useful number as I talk through the research. This is the number of undergraduate students in the UK, so 1,759,915. It's important to keep this in mind because the research that we did is representative of the UK undergraduate student population. So the percentages I'm giving to you, if you divide this total number by the, uh, by the percentage, you get a kind of sense of the number of students that are doing some of the things that I'm talking about. Okay, so this is our first finding, that for students, music is really still a key part of their identity. And we found that, especially so for, for freshers, it kind of makes sense as a fresher trying to find new friends, talking about the music that you like to try and, you know, find people that are like you to make friends with for the rest of university. We found that 54% of the students that we spoke to agreed with the statement that music is a key part of who I am. So music is still part of how they define themselves and their internal identity. We also found that 29% of students said that going to gigs and festivals was one of their major hobbies. Now this particular point is one that I would probably emphasize to you guys because the work I do with other clients and other brands, you see that young people are really, really busy and there's a lot of competition for their time. So for them to say that, um, so nearly a third, to say that music is one of their main hobbies is really great because that means that 29% who are competing with streaming, um, box sets, gaming, cinema, all that kind of stuff, it's actually really quite significant. The second uh, big finding that we found, and it's kind of contrary to the, the, the student stereotype of being kind of cash-strapped and um, being in lots of student debt. Um, it's 
that students actually are happy to pay for the music that they own. So, okay. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Okay, yeah, thank you. So this is um, uh, a pie chart from the IFPI about total volume of music sales in the UK. So handily, 44% is really the key number for last year. So 44% of music sales were physical and 44% of music sales were digital. But what does that actually mean for students? So the numbers I'm about to show you, we didn't actually replicate the same question, but it's worth noting the general population for comparison details. So we found that 53% of students had paid for a download in the last year. More than one. We didn't ask how many, but they definitely have paid for a download. We also found that 44% of students had bought a physical piece of music in the last year. This is quite interesting because it means that there's still a place for physical music in the lives of students, students who are notoriously cash-strapped. But we also asked what other things young people uh, spent their money on. So 27% of students said that they pay for their music streaming services, like Spotify. 26% of students said that they uh, bought merchandise. And 7%, and this is quite interesting, because if you do the calculation with the, the biggest figure that I mentioned earlier, that's 120,000 students who've said they've contributed to an artist's crowdfund uh, campaign. And that's a lot of students, especially when they don't have very much money. So that's, that's hopefully good news, that students still spend money on music. And also, we found that students really still love live music. 52% of the young people that we spoke to said that they go to gigs to connect with the artists or the bands that they are interested in and that they love. But really, how many students do go to these live events? So 51% of students said that they'd been to a live event in the last year. That's nearly 900,000 students who've been to a live uh, event. And then we asked about festivals as well. Have you been to a festival about music or contained music? There we found 29% of students said that they'd gone to a festival in the last year. That's over half a million students who've done that. So what does this mean? These are all the numbers that I've just thrown at you and hopefully you've got your handouts to look at later on. But from my point of view and someone who's not necessarily in your world, I see music is still quite powerful and meaningful for young people. Um, for students, they're really, they're really willing to invest the time uh, and they're well, willing to invest their personal money as well uh, for things that they feel passionately about. I'm gonna move on now. So that, they, were the, they were the statistics and that was slightly dry, but hopefully this will be a bit more interesting. Well, I'm gonna talk to you about some of the trends that I see with my clients uh, who are all kind of specialist youth marketers. The three things I'm going to talk to you about, there are three kind of trends that they're separate, but they're definitely kind of intertwined very much at the moment, is the reciprocal relationship. So this is very much about having an authentic exchange with young people. Then we're going to talk about experience and how that has become the new status symbol for young people. And then finally, owning the moment. And that's all about very emotive marketing and how to buy, uh, kind of get young people to buy into your product by making yourself seem indispensable because you're associated with a cause. So, the reciprocal relationship. For young people today, it, they don't want to be broadcast to, they don't want information to just be fed to them. They're not going to listen. They're very good at just not paying attention and carrying on. Um, I guess that could be a tea towel, maybe. Yes. But they, 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 they're not, they have so much information that they need to sort of sort through every single day. If you haven't already got that relationship with them, they're not going to pay attention to what you're trying to tell them. 
They're very savvy. So you need to have give and take in what they're, they're having, their relationship with you. You need to find some sort of common ground between both of you to really have a sense of authenticity in your relationship. Young people are very... Uh, sort of very close to the brands that, that I work with and it's almost I guess like a relationship when I ask them in focus groups to talk about sort of what they think of the different brands they sort of talk about them in very very human like terms and really if you're going to want somebody to like you you have to also like them back and so the reciprocal relationship is something that is worth bearing in mind and, and really working at but a way to sort of bring this to life from sort of modern day is the authenticity that vloggers have. So we all know about vloggers, and, and these are some of the, the sort of high-profile celebrity ones. But, but what vloggers do is they have a really kind of intimate relationship with the young people that follow them. They speak directly into the camera, so it feels like they're talking just to you. And their kind of relaxed conversational style is very, very easy to get on with and very inclusive. And that's the reciprocal relationship that young people love. So here we've got a few, a few bloggers. So we've got uh, Jack's Gap. So these are two guys that just started um, a vlog to talk about their gap year before university. But they now have 4 million followers. You've got Charlie is so cool like. He is kind of quite bumbly. He's got quite good hair, but generally is a bit of a geek and just talks about whatever comes into his mind. You've got um, PewDiePie. Now, he is a vlogger um, and talks about gaming, but he doesn't necessarily give sort of gaming cheats and things like that. He's more about finding funny things in the game world that he's in and talking to other people about that. And then, of course, we all know about Zoella. She's been everywhere in the last couple of years. She has eight and a half million followers. Uh, that watch all the videos that she posts. But all of these young people, they're marketing machines, and they all have deals with brands that any kind of, I guess, conventional celebrity would die for, and all because of their authentic reciprocal relationship. The second trend that I've noticed with the clients that I work with is that experience is definitely the new status symbol. So this is all about young people who... Uh, have grown up in the recession, and they haven't necessarily had those status symbols, those high-ticket items to sort of wear or show other people to kind of, dis to, I guess, describe who they are and what their identity is. These young people, I guess, in the last five years, the main thing that they've had is technology, and that technology has enabled them to share their life and then the birth of the selfie generation. So I guess we're all familiar with people on our Facebooks, Twitters, or Instagram, you know, sharing pictures of their food, sharing pictures of them holding a small dog. This is me with my new glasses. This is me with somebody that I've met on the street having so much fun. This is me on holiday. You know, we, we, we know all those things. We know who those people are. But actually, when people post that kind of stuff, it's also saying more about who they are. Then they're obviously defining their own identity, but us as people looking at it, we're also internalizing that and thinking, okay, that's who they are as well. And it's all thanks to. <laughs> Leave you hanging there. It wasn't, it wasn't the most. <laughs> Thanks to the mobile phone. Oh, it's a massive anticlimax. <laughs> but it is all thanks to the mobile phone. It's the technology we have in our pockets. We take it everywhere with us. And, and it enables us to live our lives in, in really quite an efficient way. But in terms of the way that we should be looking at um, the experiences that, that young people want, Ultimately, an experience has to be shareable. That's the mantra of the selfie generation. If it's not shareable, what's the point? <laughs> Press space, maybe? So I'm, the next slide... I'm going to show you. Last year, one million three customers used their phones abroad at no extra cost. Byron Bay, Australia. Best waves in the world. Fucked. 
the main advice I would give you is get your pop-ups right. Snappy. Keep that tight. Yeah. Yeah? The wave's coming in really fast. The nature of the wave is, right, you don't own the wave. The wave owns you. Warmth carve through again. We're dancing. We're dancing. Hey, go on, bro. Can't describe it. This year, three customers can use their phones abroad at no extra cost in even more destinations. Next stop, Roca Punta. Spanish waves. Including Spain from April. Yeah. <laughs> Prepare yourself. Oh, yeah. Bang it. Boom. <laughs> so that's an example of an advert where a brand is really tapping into what's going in at the, on at the moment in young people's lives, understanding that experience is everything and offering a new service for young people to share their experiences and to help define themselves as they go forward. Go on then. But before I move on, um, I'd just like to return to the data. If you could... Um, <laughs> What we've found is that music oh, is a very social experience. The other way. <laughs> oh, just to recap. <laughs> um, the, yeah, that's it, that's it. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm going back to the data on this screen, yeah, sorry. No, no, no. Um, and we found that 57% of all the students that we spoke to said that going to gigs and concerts is actually about a social experience and them being closer to their friends and socialising. We also found that 47%, so this is the, a key number as well, remember the 44% from earlier, this is a new one, 47% of the students we spoke to said that actually listening to music together with their friends is also another way that they like to socialise. So, so sort of looking at this, it makes me realise that the things that brands are wanting about having a moment, having an experience, the things that young people are already experiencing with their friends, and music is facilitating that. And that is actually really quite a powerful thing. The final, the final trend to talk about, and this is owning the moment, and it's all about rather emotive marketing uh, from brands who are trying to sort of either jump on a bandwagon or give a meaning to what, what they stand for. Young people are very forward focused. You know, for them, things like climate change are not necessarily uh, a theory anymore. It's a reality they have to deal with. Going to university, an education comes with a 40,000 pound bill that has to be accepted as debt at the age of 18. So these young people are really quite serious and their lives are not necessarily as fun as we all think because they've got a lot to think about going forward. So owning the moment is an emotive play by clever marketers who are really wanting to put their product um, somewhere that will stand out by maybe associating themselves with something else. It's not just about owning the moment, but it's also about being part of the moment, and it's also about influencing the moment, and you can imagine the work we do with clients to help with that. But for brands, it's not necessarily about sort of creating this kind of um, aspirational world where everyone is airbrushed and it's, it's, all, it's all really fancy. Brands are now looking to actually help young people. They want to understand the points in their lives that are actually troubling them and potentially offering to help. So an example of this that happened last year is when GIF, GAF and KISS came together and they ran a competition called Your Place, Your Space. Now, the winner of this competition got one year's free rent, which is a quite unbelievable prize to win. Um, but their, all their marketing and all the things that they were talking about surrounding this competition, it was about helping millennials who were really cash-strapped to move out of the family home, to gain their independence, to give them a new life. So you can imagine the way that, that this kind of played out. And obviously, to be able to enter the competition, they asked young people to create a video that they had to share on Instagram or Twitter of why they deserved that one year's free rent. But before I move on to the next slide, I'll just introduce it. I'm going to show you another ad. And this is an interesting one because it's from a brand, um, and they are really trying to identify a moment that maybe none of us had even thought about and create a moment that they associate themselves with. 
And you'll see that the brand, which is always, which we don't really talk about that much, but they don't talk about the product or show the product in any way. Hi, Aaron. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. My hair. <laughs> show me what it looks like to fight like a girl. <laughs> Uh. Now throw like a girl. Aw. So do you think you just insulted your sister? No. I mean, yeah, insulted girls, but not my sister. My name is Dakota, and I'm 10 years old. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Throw like a girl. Fight like a girl. What does it mean to you when I say run like a girl? It means run fast as you can. CC, very, very emotive. Whether you agree or disagree with this, this is happening at the moment because maybe they need other things to say. But this is probably what I'd want to leave you with, drawing together the three themes that I just mentioned. And it's that young people want a fair relationship that offers an experience that they can share and a moment for them to buy into. They're the things that are happening right now in social uh, media. They're the things that are happening in youth marketing. They're the things that are happening with the brands that I work with. So if we move on to the provocation, I'd just like to um, sort of bring everything together that I've mentioned. If we, if we look forward to 2020, so yeah, 2020, um, that's only five years away. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the things that I think will happen, things I think that won't happen, and then maybe we can, on the panel, think about my provocation and, and my kind of, my, my statement of the three themes that I've just presented, so. So in 2020, things will have changed. We won't necessarily be buying as many things as we have at the moment. So this is a picture of a three, um, 3D printer. All the pictures on the internet seem to have this small red rabbit in it. I'm sure that maybe in five years' time we will be printing small red rabbits. But um, this is a 3D printer. Not, I'm not necessarily saying that this is going to be in your homes, but I'm saying that you will have access to one through some service or another to be able to make some of the things that you want when you want them. And this is going to really disrupt things quite, quite substantially. But what will also happen, because things won't necessarily be sold off the shelf anymore, that marketing and marketers will really have to think about what they're doing and evolve in a very different way. The way that the tell sell is dead. You can't just ask people, especially not young people, to buy things because you've told them to. But I think that this will remain the same. So 2020, that music will still continue to offer an authentic experience and meaningful moments. Now, the words I'm using here are quite important because they're the words I've been using throughout this presentation that brands are looking for, that brands want to tap into, that brands want to use. So I guess my provocation is this, that by 2020, Brands will want to own authentic experiences and meaningful moments of live music. And is this a threat or an opportunity? Thank you.